25 years ago, I graduated from UCI. We were a little smaller, we were in Aldridge Park, but if I was to tell you 25 years ago where my life would lead in that trajectory, I would have never anticipated the things I have been able to see, experience, and accomplish. So I want to take you backwards to go forward. When my parents dropped me off here in the fall of 1987, it was a very different era. I look out and I see humanity students and ICS. So I want to tell you how different it was for me as a young humanity student. My parents dropped me off. I had come to cheerleading camp here the summer before, so I knew it was a special place. I didn't realize all these years later I would come and cheer in this very arena for Mamadou and our amazing basketball team. But my parents dropped me off at the dorms with this big, clunky suitcase. It didn't have wheels like we have today. And I was off and running. I was forewarned about that freshman 15. I don't think I've ever lost that freshman 15, <laughs> but I was thrilled to be here anyways. I had that old antiquated television set, and back in the day, we didn't have cable. I had to change the channel manually. I did not have a computer. I had an old school typewriter that I hooked up to a screen for all of my humanities papers. I didn't have a cell phone. God forbid for all of you with your smartphones, I had, I had to use an old-fashioned telephone to call my parents, to stack up on all of those quarters to do my laundry. And then at 9 a.m. every Monday, I went to the Edwards Cinema across the street to my first humanities core class. It was 9 a.m., the floor was sticky with Coke and there was popcorn smell, and I sat in that theater and learned about Socrates and philosophy, and I found myself. And for those of you that came to this university, whether you are right out of high school or transfer, hopefully over the two or four years or even more, as you've been through the halls, as you've met professors, hopefully you found yourself, found your calling, found your voice. My sophomore year, something happened that stopped me in my tracks. I turned on that old-fashioned television set, and I saw a young boy in the center of Tiananmen Square, China standing in front of a tank. You can Google it, you can find it online, but I remember watching it live and thinking, what is this young boy standing up for? What is he standing up to? And somehow, some way, I realized it was bigger than himself, whether it was democracy, the right for an education, the right to be seen, the right to be heard. Up until that moment, watching that young boy stand in front of a tank, I thought I would graduate from this university and stand in front of a judge and a jury and become a lawyer. But watching that young boy stand up for something that was so much bigger than himself, I realized, I don't think I want to walk into that courtroom and stand in front of that judge and jury. By that point, it's too late. So I made a decision that I wanted to be a teacher, and not just any teacher, but I wanted to have the ability to stand up for kids who felt invisible, who didn't have a voice, who were on the fringe and the margins. So I told my dad that I was no longer going to be a lawyer, I was going to be a teacher. And he didn't take the news so well. He quickly reminded me that teachers don't make very much money, which is true. He also told me I would never afford a home in Newport Beach, which is actually still true to this very day. But I wanted to show my dad it had nothing to do about money. It was that psychic income, that aha moment, that light bulb that goes off and you know someone's getting it and there's a connection. I knew nothing about being a teacher, but I was ready to learn. And I'll never forget that first day, I, I walked into that classroom, I had 150 students, and they were miserable. And their sole purpose was to make me as miserable as they were, and they did a really good job. I pranced into that classroom like I had pranced into UCI, like a cheerleader from hell. I wore polka dots, I had pearls, I had my syllabus with all of those stories I'd learned in my humanities core classes. I wanted Shakespeare to leap out of the pages of a book. I wanted Homer and that tale of an odyssey to speak to my students. And then shortly thereafter, I watched my syllabus come right back at me in the form of a paper airplane. A disgruntled student stood up and he asked me, um, why do we have to read books written by dead white guys in tights? Which is a very profound question. In his mind, Shakespeare was not going to leap out of the pages of any book. In his mind, 
Homer was not going to put food on that table for that hardworking mom because no matter how hard she worked, no matter how hard she tried, there was never going to be enough food on that table. She was gonna, never going to get that rose from a bachelor. She was never going to get her 15 minutes. And in that moment, I reached for these marble journals. I passed them out, and I just wanted my students to write. Write what needed to be written. Tell what needed to be told. Tell me something. So I told my students, I don't care about punctuation or grammar or spelling for this assignment. Tell me. Tell me what you've seen. Tell me where you've been. But at that moment, my students weren't ready to let me in. Sometimes it's easier to push people away than pull them closer. So one of my students, a notorious gangbanger who walked into my classroom with an ankle monitor, a probation officer, and a black eye, she picked up that pen, she picked up that marble journal, and she wrote, and I quote, I hate Aaron Gruel. She wrote it twice, I hate Aaron Gruel, just in case I didn't read it the right the first time. And here's the doozy. And if I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her, exclamation point. Uh, I grew up in suburbia. I went to UC Irvine. I was living in Newport Beach. I didn't know what shanking was. I just knew it wasn't good. <laughs> I went to that Urban Dictionary and I confirmed it's not good. So I realized if I wanted to get my students to tell what needs to be told, I need to think about that young boy standing in Tiananmen Square, those feelings I had at that vigil right here at UCI. What would make somebody stand up, stand up for something that's bigger? So I wanted to give my students an opportunity to stand up, to be seen. So I decided to play a game that was anything but and I called it the line game. I simply put this piece of tape down the center of my classroom, almost as if you could see it in this auditorium now. Divided my classroom, took out anything and everything that felt like academia. Those pencils, those number two um, pencils and ballpoint pens, scantrons and tests. And I was simply going to ask them questions. Where they'd been, who they were. And I knew enough to know that my competition is pop culture that song, that hip-hop artist, that movie, that icon. So my first few questions were really silly. Stand on the line if you have the new Snoop Dogg CD. They looked around, they rolled their eyes, they thought, huh, this woman is crazy. But at least we're not at that desk, at least we don't have that number two pencil, let's go for it. So they came to that line, kept, kept thinking, what is she gonna ask next? Stay on the line if you've seen Boys in the Hood. And once again, there was some eye rolling, some thinking that I was losing it. What does this have to do with academia? What does this have to do with me or education or this English class? And then I got bold. I thought about that boy in Tiananmen Square standing up. And I began to ask questions that mattered. Stay on, on the line if you know someone who is poor. And every single one of my students, regardless of shape or size or color or hue, stood on that line. Because each and every one of my students knew in the pit of their stomach what it felt like to be poor. And at that moment, I realized I can continue to ask questions. And maybe, just maybe, my kids will stand. They stood for poverty. They were homeless. They stood when I asked questions about their parents, things their parents did or didn't do, being bullied, wanting to have a voice, wanting things to be bigger, wanting things to be better. And each and every time I asked a question and my students stood on that line, I realized it's a story. It may not have been written by Shakespeare or Homer, but it's a story nonetheless. And I need to convince my students to put down that fist Put down that spray can, put down that gun, pick up a pen, and write a different ending to a different story. To use words, not weapons. To immortalize themselves, to create a movement, and start a legacy. So as I was driving home, making that drive from the inner city back to Newport Beach, I thought about that boy once again. What do you do when you're seen? How do you create a movement? Because it's young people who can risk everything. So I decided that we were going to pick up a plastic champagne glass filled with sparkling apple cider, and we were going to have a toast, a toast to change. We were going to wipe that slate clean. Starting right then, starting right now, my kids were going to start over. 
Because unlike you who had straight A's in the womb, straight A's in kindergarten and beyond, most of my students had a .5 GPA. Most of my students had been kicked out of every class they'd ever attended. Most of my students went from school to school to school. They didn't think they were going to graduate. They didn't think they were going to go to college. They didn't aspire for higher education. They just wanted to be alive by their 18th birthday. They just didn't want to be behind bars. They didn't want to get pregnant before they even turned 15. I wanted my students to believe that they could do anything, go anywhere, and more importantly, become anything. So I stole a cue from a friend of mine who was a kindergarten teacher, because let's face it, kindergarten teachers are much more fun. So I blew up some balloons. I made some silly signs. I went out and got plastic champagne glasses, sparkling apple cider, and we were going to make it old school, back in the day, like show and tell. Because a lot of kids miss out on that. Maybe they don't have anything to show. Maybe they're afraid to tell. So I wanted my kids for the first time to pick up a plastic champagne glass and make that toast to things being better, to breaking a cycle, to having a voice and to use it. So each and every one of my students picked up that plastic champagne glass and made that toast. They were tired of being poor. They were tired of being picked on. They were tired of being tired. And as each and every one of my students started to dream, they began to dream big. I stand before you as an ordinary teacher who wanted my students to have an extraordinary experience, to realize that they could write a different ending to their own story. So we began to read, we began to watch, we began to integrate these two worlds of humanities and ICS and bring stories to life, images. The most poignant of all was written by a little girl in a tiny little attic, a little girl who looked out her window and watched her friends being let off like sheep to slaughter, a little girl in a tiny little attic who immortalized her story with a piece of paper and a pen. My students read a book for the very first time, The Diary of Anne Frank, and then they wanted to know everything about her. When that story ended, did it continue? So we decided that we were gonna write to the woman who hid Anne Frank, imagine that. At that time, she was 87 years old. She was living in Amsterdam. And my students thought that if we write her letters, send them to her like a message in a bottle, that this little woman, 87 years old, will hop on a plane, fly across the globe, come talk to 150 gangsters. It's that simple. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's not that simple. But my students sat down at computers, the first time ever, and began to write and tell their story. And when I sent those stories across the globe, I have to tell you, there was typos. There was grammar mistakes. But when that 87-year-old woman, a simple secretary who had helped eight people in an attic for two years in the middle of a war, in the middle of the Holocaust, when she sat down to read my students' stories, I think she saw something in them that she saw in Anne. Promise. Potential. Hope. The same things that each and every one of us on this stage see when we look out. Every dean, every speaker, every provost, every professor looks out into this sea of students and we see just that. The possibilities, the promise, the hope that each and every one of you have to go out and make our world better. So when this little woman sat down and began to read those stories, she decided to hop on a plane, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the side of the street they came from, regardless of what their parents did or didn't do, regardless of those typos and those grammar mistakes. She came for them. In the same way that each and every parent and grandparent and friend and sister and brother are here for you today to celebrate, to honor, to hoot and holler, to have our hearts leap out of our chest because we are so proud of what you've accomplished, what you have done, in this amazing academic journey. When that little woman walked into our life, she was four foot nothing, and yet she was larger than life. I think she felt like she was as tall as Mamadou himself. 
and she walked into our lives and she gave my students a challenge. She challenged my students to make sure that Anne's death was not in vain. And at that moment, my students realized there was a legacy. They were gonna pick up a pin as if it was a baton and pass it forward. And in passing it forward, legacies would be formed. Movements would be created. So as an ordinary teacher, I have to tell you, I watched 150 kids who weren't supposed to make it be the first in their families, the first to graduate from high school. And then I watched those same students be the first in their families to go off to college, just like many of you. And those same students, year after year, say it's not enough. I want to go back and get my master's. I want to get my doctorate. I want to continue. UCI is one of those special places that has students from every corner of our globe. And many of you that are sitting before us are the first in your family, the first to go to college. So I'd like humbly to ask each and every one of you graduates, if you are the first in your family that's going to graduate, can you stand for a moment so we can honor you? If you are the first in your family to graduate, stand. I want you to stand. For those of you that are standing, you may not have to stand in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square. You may not have to stand in a line in a classroom like my students did. But stand up for something that is bigger. Be brave. Be bold. Know that every single person that is sitting there and looking at you is living vicariously through every test, every moment, every pomp, and every circumstance that this graduation is not yours and yours alone. It's for every single person who is now going to walk in the road that you paved. Every single person who comes after you. And when I say to you that young people can change the world, do just that. Do just that because I have learned that young people can change the world. My students went on to write a book. They'd never read a book before, and then they went on to write a book that was the number one book in America. My students were able to take their story and put it on the big screen. And I think a lot of you are probably very disappointed that Hilary Swank is not standing at this podium and you get an ordinary teacher. <laughs> but for those students who were able to immortalize their story, they realized that in this integrated world, it's going to take two schools to come together. All of our storytellers, all of our linguistics and language folks, all of my humanities peep, I would not have been able to tell my story if it wasn't for all of my computer folks on this side to write those books, to make those movies. When I started this process, none of my kids had cell phones or smartphones or computers. We didn't have email. We didn't have Google. We had to go to the library the old-fashioned way. We had to look things up in books and use a Dewey Decimal System. Things have changed. Things are now instantaneous. Things are now fast and furious at our fingertips. The world is changing. There are apps. There are inventors in our audience. So when there is the fusion of these two worlds, our storytellers and our dreamers and our makers, imagine what can happen in 25 years from today. One of you are going to be standing where I am standing, looking out at your people, your peeps, your posse, and realizing that you've changed the world. You've moved that dial just a bit. You've made your mark. And that's what it means to be an anteater, to come here, to learn everything you can, to soak it up, to go out and be brave, bold, and bigger and better, and change the legacy. At some point, we're gonna be busting at the seams. We're not gonna have enough seats in this room to fit all of the graduates that are gonna come each and every year. But how lucky are we? So when you leave here today, don't leave forever. UCI realizes they can't get rid of me even if they try to shake a stick at me. I am obsessed with this place. 
because this place taught me who I am, what I wanted to be, what I want to do, who I want to become. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to do the same. Let us know what you're doing, the mark that you're making, the places you will go, the people you will touch, the person you will become. And just like that boy in Tiananmen Square, stand boldly, stand bravely, and make us all proud. Thank you.